We're glad that you have chosen to join us tonight. Uh, we're going to be continuing our Bible study in Luke chapter 9. Uh, we'll be in and around verse 37 is where we left off, but uh, we're going to back up a little bit before that just so we can get some context uh, as to what's going on um, in, in the study, in the gospel. And so um, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll go ahead and start. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you just for everything that you are, that you are, are covering, that you are our Savior, that you are the healer, that you are the provider. And so would you just bless the time that we're going to spend in your word tonight, Lord. We want to hear from you, and so we pray just for an outpouring and a filling of your Holy Spirit that we might hear you and know you more. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so with that, we are in Luke chapter 9. And in Luke chapter 9, what is happening right at this particular point in time is that Jesus uh, was transfigured up on the mountain. And as the transfiguration, as we'll call it, has taken place, uh, remember Peter, James, and John went up there on the mountain with him. And as he was transfigured, it says that uh, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And then there was two special visitors that came there as well. Uh, Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets. And uh, you can imagine what, what a scene this would have been. But there's one thing that I didn't point out last week that I wanted to, and I just kind of glossed over it. Um, but we're going to point it out here tonight before we really continue on in this chapter it says in verse 28 it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took peter james and john and went up to the mountain to pray and then notice verse 29 as he prayed the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening and i just want just a quick reminder i don't want to spend a bunch of time here tonight but just a quick reminder prayer changes things what was the circumstance? Jesus is, is getting prepared. He's on route going to the cross to be crucified. And he goes up on the mountain to pray. And as he's up there praying, his appearance is altered. The glory comes out. And I think that there's something to that with us too, that as we pray, that, that the, we're, we're in tune with the, in, with the heavenlies. It's, you know, the prayer is how we get access to the heavenly realm. And, you know, number one, when we're saved, it comes through Jesus. But once we're saved, we don't just like automatically have this connection all the time. We have to plug in, so to speak, to be connected. And we plug in, we have the power to have the glory shining through us, just like Jesus had his glory shining in you know, if you think of it like prayer as plugging in a lamp, and what happens when you plug in a lamp, the, it now has power, and when you turn it on, boom, the light shines and it brightens up the room. Well, that's essentially what's going on. Jesus begins to pray, boom, he lights up, his glory comes out, and Moses and Elijah are there. Peter, James, and John were sleeping. They wake up. They, Peter says some goofy things about putting up a tabernacle for Moses and Elijah and Jesus, sort of putting them all on the same playing field. And then he gets rebuked by the Shekinah cloud that overcomes them. And God says, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Don't listen to, you don't need Moses. Not that the law wasn't important. You don't need Elijah. Not that the prophets weren't important, but now you have God in the flesh Hear him, hear him, listen to him. And so this is what we would call, if you're Peter, James, or John, and maybe you've had this experience in your own Christian life, this is what we would call a spiritual high, a mountaintop experience. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, it's like, great. You think what, what happens on a mountaintop? You, you go on a climb and you get to the top and you get rewarded with the beautiful views. You get to see things from a different vantage point. It's awe-inspiring. 
And that's what Peter, James, and John got to see this awe-inspiring event. They literally were set foot sort of in a, in a kingdom of God as it was brought to earth right there in Jesus and his glory, and Moses and Elijah and their glory. And they got to experience this amazing. They got to hear the, the voice of God from the cloud. And man, you can just imagine what kind of a spiritual high that they're on. And maybe you've had this sort of experience in your Christian walk where you go on a mission trip or you go to a men's retreat or a ladies retreat or a youth camp and you're on this spiritual high. You leave there, you've been worshiping, you've been reading the Bible and studying the Bible and praying with people and you have this, this spiritual high and you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm never coming down from this place. I'm just going to stay here with Jesus forever. Even when I go back home and life begins, I'm going to stay in this place of this spiritual high. Well, here's what I have to say to that. That's good in theory, but here's what I have to say to that. Beware. Beware. And we're going to look at something here in a minute, but this happens often. People go on a mission trip. Uh, I was overseeing missions for a number of years and, and people were going on these mission trips and they go on this, they get on this spiritual high and I would always warn them, hey, you're going to have great experiences. You're going to see God do awesome things, but you're going to come back home and you're going to you're going to have a kind of a spiritual low. And I would oftentimes take them through this little portion of scripture as a, as a devotional time, just to, as a reminder, like, Hey, those things that you were doing at that women's retreat or at that youth camp or on the mission trip, the, the devotional every day, the serving God, doing what God wants you to do, being willing to step out in faith. Those are things we want to do in our everyday life. But the, the everyday life, isn't just dedicated to that one thing. You have all the other things in life. You have to go to work. You have a family to, to take care of. You've got you know, to rush your kids around to sports or to, uh, in our case, to athletic training and back and forth or whatnot. But um, so here's another thing to keep in mind. The mountaintop experiences are great. I want everybody to have mountaintop experiences, but you cannot live on the mountaintop. If you've ever been on a mountaintop, experiences are great. I want everybody to have mountaintop experiences, but you cannot live on the mountaintop. If you've ever been on a mountaintop, the mountaintop is not a very habitable place. Typically, it's barren. When you get to the top, there's, there might be snow up there, but you're above the tree line on a mountaintop. You have great views, but there's no running water there. There's no life there. Why? Because all the life is in the valley. As you come down the mountain, you hit the tree line, you begin to see rivers and streams, and then everything collects in the valley. And that's where people live. Good, bad, and indifferent people live in the valley. Why? Because all the life goes there. The animals go down that way, which you're going to have to hunt for food. If you're going to go to the, the grocery store, all the things that we do to live happen in the valley, not on a mountaintop. The mountaintop's a great place to go out, get away, to have a great experience with the Lord. But then as you come down, you're back into life as it is. And after a mountaintop experience, you can be sure that you're going to face some sort of spiritual battle. Because look what happens to the disciples. They've had this Peter, James, and John have been with Jesus. They've been in this spiritual high. Now, verse 37 says, Now it happened on the next day when they came down from the mountain that a great multitude met him. And suddenly a man from the multitude cried out saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my only son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. So they had this spiritual high experience. And as they come down, who do they run into? The devil or the demonic realm, right? He's always around. He's, the Bible says he goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Jesus said in John 10 that he came to give life and life more abundantly, but the thief, Satan, came to steal and kill 
and destroy. And that's what we're going to look at that too. But from this spiritual high experience, now they come down. This gospel doesn't tell us, but the others do that. The, the religious leaders were also there arguing with Jesus' disciples about what was happening here. The disciples can't cast out the demon. Remember, Jesus sent them out on a mission trip just not long ago, and he gave them power over the demonic realm. So what's going on now? Why can't they cast out this demon? Why can't they help this man? And it says there's this great multitude. Perhaps the multitude has heard of what the disciples were doing. And now the multitude is sitting there and the multitude is like, what's going on? Why can't maybe there's some, some grumbling, you know, oh, I knew these guys were too good to be true and that kind of thing. But then suddenly this man from the multitude, it turns out to be the father. He cries out to Jesus and says, I implore you, look, I beg you, look on or check out my only son. He's my only child. And behold, he tells this, this what's happening to him. Here's, here's, you go to the doctor, right? And, or at least we used to go to the doctor. I try to avoid him now. Uh, but uh, before everything was COVID, you used to go to the doctor and they would diagnose you with something besides that. And so you go to the doctor and you say, here's my symptoms. I've got a stuffy nose, my ear hurts, and I have a sore throat. And they would look and they would say, well, you look in your ear and they say, well, yep, your eardrum is all red. You have an ear infection. You tell them what was wrong. So that's what he's, he's coming to the great physician with his son, and he's telling him the problem. And one of the other gospels, it tells us that the, it says the boy was epileptic, but not to be confused at saying that everybody who is epileptic is also demon-possessed because we're specifically told that those epileptic seizures that this boy was having was as a result of being demon-possessed. And so... He says, I beg you, look on my only son. He's my only child. The spirit seizes him and he cries out and it convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. Uh, the other gospels tell us that when these seizures would happen, it would often be near fire or water. Imagine having a seizure and falling into water or into a fire. Like you better hope somebody's right there with you or you're going to drown or burn to death. And I want to point this out. Number one, oftentimes the, the church underplays the demonic realm. We, we, you hear a lot. And it's true that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But that doesn't mean that the demonic realm doesn't have power. I don't want to mess with it. I want to know Jesus. I want the Holy Spirit. And I don't want anything to do with the demonic realm. But the demonic realm does exist. And what, what is the purpose of the demonic realm? Well, Satan was an angel, and he chose to rebel against God. And the Bible communicates that he took a third of the angelic host with him. And Bible scholars and the Bible teaches that those hosts of angels that fell with him are what we refer to as demons or the demonic realm. And the Bible talks about there's, there's different levels of of demons spiritual hosts of wickedness at at principalities and powers different rankings so to speak uh in in several places throughout the scripture we're told that there's some who are so bad that they're still being held in chains until the the great tribulation when they're going to be released from those chains to cause more havoc on the earth. So there is a demonic realm. Now, another question comes up is how can I be, as a Christian, can I be demon possessed? And my answer is no, you cannot be. If you're a Christian, if you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, God is not into timeshares. He doesn't move out of the way so a demon can take over, but you can be demonically oppressed from the outside not possessed from the inside and if you're oppressed from the outside maybe it looks like depression maybe it looks like a fog maybe it looks like uh, anxiety or just whatever I don't know what it, it can all look like in everybody's life it could be something different but it is real and it is something that needs to be dealt with and we're going to see uh, how Jesus deals with it but then he's so this kid is getting thrown into the fire. And may, might I remind you, like I just did, the thief comes to steal and to kill 
and to destroy. Let me remind you that Satan hates you. He wants nothing good for you. He's only trying to get you to not follow Jesus. He'll dangle a carrot out in front of you, whether it's money or lust or fame or whatever it is, drugs, and he'll try to get you to follow that carrot and it'll seem like a great time until he's got his now like a fish when you follow the lure and you bite down on it. Now you got a hook in your mouth and you're, you're hooked and you can't get away. And the only thing that can set you free is Jesus. And so how does one get demon possessed? Well, if you're number one, you're not a believer in Jesus, but number two, have you, have you opened up your eye and ear gate to something demonic? Have you allowed something into your life? Parents got to be careful. If you're allowing things into your home, you, you can affect your kids. This is a father bringing a son. Well, how did the son get demon possessed, but the father's not? Then perhaps there was something introduced in the home. And what the, the, the demonic realm looks kind of like a toy sometimes. Hollywood tries to portray it that way as these movies and things like that. Like it's just for fun, but it's not for fun. It's real and it will wipe you out. And might I suggest that it also doesn't look always as scary as it does in the movies. However, once a person is possessed, then it gets pretty scary. We read about it a chapter or two ago about the naked man who was cutting himself and couldn't sleep and couldn't be bound by chains and he was demon-possessed too. This is what happens too. This kid is getting thrown into the fire. And Satan's not interested in helping this guy be better. He's, help, he's interested in wiping this kid out, ruining the whole family's life. Again, if the kid gets wiped out, then the dad is wiped out. And so it convulses him, throws him into the fire. He foams at the mouth. It departs from him with great difficulty. Notice it says bruising him. That's interesting, isn't it? He gets bruised as the spirit comes and goes, as the demonic spirit comes and goes. And so I implore your disciples, I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they couldn't do it. They could not do it. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And I read this as, Jesus looking at the disciples, the religious leaders, saying, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I bear with you? Looks at the dad and says, bring him here. Now, an interesting thing is Jesus could have said, too bad, so sad. You got involved in it. Go back home and deal with it yourself. He could have said, oh, well, they couldn't do it. I don't have time. But Jesus still looks at the man and he says, bring your son here. I, I, I'm going to heal him. I'm going to take care of this. And so as this happens, it says, as he was still coming on his way to Jesus, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. It's like one last, I got to get one last shot in. I got to get a, 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 try to get a knockout blow, so to speak. One last time. And then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. So I find that awesome. Right? It's like maybe you've had this experience or maybe you know someone who's had this experience where they have uh, like a wayward kid or something or you know somebody that's been wayward and then they come back, they come to Jesus and it's not only do they get saved and they get right with God, but then they're able to be, come back home. They're able to come back to their family, back to their friends. And that relationship is able to be restored as well. And I want to point out that Jesus works even in our shortcomings. So there's these disciples couldn't cast the demon out. The religious leaders couldn't cast the demon out. But then Jesus, even in their shortcomings, he didn't say too bad, so sad. He, he healed. He, he brought healing to this situation. And I think that's something that we need to remember, too. We all have shortcomings. The Bible, Romans says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yet even in our shortcomings, God will work in us and he'll work through us and he'll work with us. 
And so uh, Jesus heals this boy, gives him back to his dad. And then it notes that it says in verse 43 that they were all amazed. This would be the multitudes of people that were there at the majesty of God. Who else was there that would have been amazed? It's, I find interesting. In, it doesn't say it here, but in the other Gospels, the religious leaders were there. They're there and amazed too. And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. But while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did, did, he said to his disciples, Let those words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them, so that they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him, about this saying. So again, like they're amazed at the majesty of God. Here, everybody's in awe, jaw dropper, right? That, that Jesus has healed this boy. They've seen it all right in front of their eyes. The demon has been cast out. And then Jesus, it's like he slinks away with his disciples so that he can pass along a special message. He doesn't want them focused on what just happened. And in the other Gospels, it tells us that there's a, they give a little more insight. The disciples want to know, hey, why couldn't we cast this demon out? And Jesus gives an insight because this type, this one, comes out only by prayer and fasting. And that indicates to me that there's a need to be praying and fasting frequently because you never know when something might happen, right? And you could use the argument, well, they, they didn't know that they were going to have this situation happen. If they knew, then they would have prayed and fasted. And, but that's the point, that they weren't prayed up. They weren't fasting. And so this, this is what happens. And so they were amazed at the majesty of God. And Jesus takes them to the side. And while all the people are ooing and aahing about what just happened, Jesus has a message for his disciples. And he says, let these words sink down into your ears. Like, pay attention. I've got something important to tell you. The Son of Man, that's Jesus, is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. Right? The multitudes are in awe. But then as they're in awe, Jesus speaks of this, that he's going to be betrayed. What a weird thing to talk about, right? That they're in awe because this is like in line with what the Messiah is supposed to do. He's supposed to heal people and people are supposed to be in awe. The Messiah is going to be on. And now Jesus is saying that he's going to be betrayed. What? That doesn't make any sense. The people are cheering for you. What do you mean that they're in awe? What do you mean you're going to be betrayed? And it says that, he tells them, let it sink down into your ears because it's not what they wanted to hear and it's not something they expected to hear. And he, he, why did the Son of Man have to be betrayed? They didn't even ask that. It says that they, the meaning was hidden from them they, so they couldn't understand and they were afraid to ask about this thing. He's got to ask all kinds of questions. But right now they're afraid to ask, well, what do you mean by that? Right? And so, I again, like, why the question I would have is why did the Son of Man have to be betrayed into the sons of men or into the hands of the sons of men? Because there was a greater healing that was needing to occur. We the the demon the demon the demon was cast out. The demon was cast out. Maybe his name was Demon, but the, the demon was cast out and the boy was healed, we're told that. But if the boy doesn't receive Jesus or doesn't become a follower of Jesus, he's still going to die and go to hell. There's a more important healing that is going to take place at the cross as Jesus is crucified and he takes the penalty for the sin of all mankind that whoever believes in him won't perish but will have everlasting life. The greater healing has to occur. That's why he has to be betrayed. They want to set him up as the king. He's saying, no, I'm going to be betrayed. And it's something that has to happen. 
greater healing needs to occur. But they were afraid to ask him. And then we said, well, why, why again? Why were they afraid to ask him? Well, look at verse 46. It says, then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be the greatest. Why didn't they understand? Because they're too busy arguing about who's going to be the greatest when Jesus sets up his kingdom. That's why. Uh, that's what I think why. They're, they've seen this thing happen, and then amongst themselves, they're so, oh, hey, me and James and John, we Peter talking, we got to go up on the mountain with them. We can't tell you what we saw, but it was really cool. He's going to make us number one in the kingdom. And then the other guys are maybe there saying, well, we've been down here the whole time holding down the fort. We deserve some credit for that. He's going to make us high in the kingdom. And they're arguing about who's going to be the great, greatest in the kingdom. Imagine the scene. Jesus told them, hey, guys, I want you to know that the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. Oh, yeah, okay. Hey, who's going to be the greatest? I'm going to be the greatest. No, you're going to be the greatest. And there's an argument between them right after Jesus just tells them this important message. Parents understand that, right? You tell your kids something important and then they forget. And you got to remind them. They're no different from us. So they had this dispute. They didn't understand. They, they weren't understanding this concept of denial of self, losing your life for the sake of following Jesus. Right? Jesus said, remember in 923, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. The disciples were there. They heard it. But they're still trying to figure out, not deny the self, not whoever... Uh, loses his life for Jesus' sake will save it, but they're trying to promote themselves to who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. They didn't understand. So if you don't fully understand, it's okay. These disciples are a great uh, reminder that God works with knuckleheads and that, and that knuckleheads can grow in their relationship and in their walk with Him and become more Christ-like as time goes on. But before we get to that, there's some even some more knuckleheaded stuff in this chapter. And so Jesus, as they're wondering about who's going to be the greatest, he perceives the thought of their heart. He took a little child and set him, the little child, by him, Jesus, and said to them, the disciples, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me for he who is least among you all will be great right and so jesus this is such an interesting thing that happens over and over through the gospel it says he perceives their thoughts he perceives the thought of their heart what are you thinking right now what do you think about on a daily basis are you trying to figure out how you're going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Maybe not even the kingdom of God. Maybe you're just trying to figure out how you're going to be the greatest at work or, or in your sport or at school or whatever. Jesus perceives the thoughts of your heart. Maybe you're having problems in relationships or you don't like somebody. Jesus perceives the thoughts of your heart. And that's, that's a scary thought and a comforting thought too because he already knows what you're thinking he still loves you so if you take those things to him there's forgiveness for you there and he will help you work through it but if you're not willing then you got problems but he knows the thoughts of their heart and so rather than rebuke them and give them a lecture oh you guys are always fighting about who's going to be the greatest let me let me give you a lesson Right? Instead of doing that, he gives them an object lesson. He takes a little kid. There's a little kid nearby, and he gets the little kid. That's something else to note about Jesus. The little kids weren't afraid of him. If you went in the mall and you're trying to give an object lesson with somebody else's little kid, like the kid's going to start screaming. The parents are going to start screaming. The security is going to be running. Jesus had a way about him that people weren't afraid. And so he gets this little kid, and he sets the little kid next to him, and he says to them, whoever receives this little child, and he's, he's physically got a kid there. Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me, for he who is least among you all will be great. What, what does that all mean? We love kids. What's wrong with kids? Well, in that culture, kids were looked at more as like just they get in the way. 
until they get to a certain age, they weren't considered really useful for much. Kids wanted to talk and they got shushed. You don't have anything to say. You don't know anything. Right? And what happens with Jesus is he says, get this kid and introduce him to me. That's how you'd be great. And they're like, wait a minute, hold on. We want to have the ministry and the kingdom to, to the multitudes. We want to be known as the greatest in the kingdom. We want, to, we want to put those religious leaders to shame. We want Rome to be under our thumb. We want to be the greatest. And Jesus says, you want to be the greatest? Start hanging out with the little kids. Tell them about me. Whoever wants to be great will make himself the least. And they had to be the least, again, because kids weren't, weren't considered worth anything. There, there was no children's ministry. They, there was no children's ministry. The kids would, I don't know what they did, but Jesus is saying, hey, if you, if you receive this kid, it's, it, if you step down off of your pedestal and you're willing to go to the least, you're receiving me as you do that. And when you take me on, you also get the Father who sent me. That's pretty awesome, right? So what's the problem that we see in churches so often today? The, the churches are interested in who has the most power in the church, who can give the most money, who, how they can become the most famous, how they can get on TV, and how, you know, can I set up 10 satellite campuses and all this other stuff? We'll never, never raise up an assistant pastor. We're just going to have all these satellite campuses and post my, my picture on the screen. Trying to be the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus, be the least. And so, what's the deal with kids? Why did Jesus like kids so much? Well, why are kids an example of how we need to receive the kingdom of God. Because kids are non-threatening. If you're an adult, kids don't really threaten you. They might annoy you, they might a whole bunch of other things, but they don't threaten you. You're not scared of little kids. Right? Kids believe very easily. You tell them Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and if you believe him, you can spend eternity in heaven. They're like, really? Okay, I want to believe. Kids believe. They don't. They don't ask. So I was listening to this this apologetics channel today on YouTube, and they were having this debate over was there a literal atom, and they had all this scientific evidence that yes, there's a, a literal atom, but then is it is it a, a young Earth? Is it an old Earth? Was there Neanderthals? Were Neanderthals human? Was there people outside the garden, or was it only Adam and Eve inside the garden? Could Adam and Eve really be the the, the mother and father of all of creation. And I'm like, why are they making this so difficult? The Bible says that God created the earth, and on the sixth day he created man and made him in his own image. From the man he made the woman, and he told them to populate the earth. That's what God said. I believe it. I don't need to go have this. It was an interesting discussion, but it was way too heady for me. And I'm like, that makes my brain hurt. More power to the people who want to do that, but God's word's pretty simple. I don't need to know all the science and all this and that and the other to believe what God's word says, like a child. I told my kids when they were growing up, we told them the story of, or the account, I should say, of Noah's Ark. That there was a worldwide flood, that the highest mountaintop was covered, that God brought two of every kind of animal, male and female, into the ark. And except for the birds, there were some more birds than two of every kind. But he brought, he brought them to Noah, and they went into the ark, and then God flooded the earth. Guess what? My kids believed it. They weren't too intellectual to go, well, how are all those animals going to fit onto a boat? I mean, what, what size? And was there really room for everyone? And... You know, all this kind of stuff. When I, t when I told them the story about Jonah being swallowed by a great fish, you know what? They believe it. 
They didn't have to look at the, well, a blue whale doesn't really open its mouth that big and they only, they don't eat meat. They only eat plants. And so I don't see that happening. And like, stop being intellectual. Just believe what God's word says. Like a child, believe it. If you, Jesus said, if you can't believe like a child, then you can't be saved. And that's kind of a like, whoa, what did he say? Am I being too intellectual? Just believe what God's word says and do it. And so I also used to tell my kids that I was like a great athlete and that I was an Olympian in like all kinds of sports. I was a figure skater. I was a ski jumper. I played hockey. Told them that like I had a, I had sprained my ankle and it just ruined my career. And like they used to go, oh, really, Dad? Because they believed it, right? Now they know I wasn't telling the truth. Yeah, broke my big toe. But the point being is that they did. I didn't have to convince them. They believed it, and you know, that's how we need to be. And that's what's so great about kids. And that's why it's important as as parents and adults that we're interested in pouring into kids because they believe, and that belief sticks with them for a lifetime. That's why when people have been lied to and they've been part of a cult or something like that, and they've gotten all this false information for their whole life, why it's so hard for them to come away from that and to believe something else, because from the beginning they've been getting lied to. Now they don't know what to believe. And so as we continue, it says, John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. So they have these, there's these lessons that they're getting. John's like, hey, we, you know, we went out and we saw these guys casting out demons and we told them not to do that because they weren't part of our crew, right? That's like the Presbyterian church down the street from the Baptist church. Well, don't go over there because they don't do it exactly the same way we do. Oh, hold on. Jesus says, don't do that. If they're not against you, they're on your side. There's enough people who are against you as a Christian that the people who are on your side are not fighting against you. Why are you worried about them? Paul gives us a little example of this in Philippians chapter 1 where there were some people who were trying to hurt Paul by sharing the gospel and making Paul's ministry doing damage to Paul's ministry. And so he says, chapter 1 of Philippians, verse 15, Some indeed preach Christ, even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Listen to what Paul says. Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. So, if Jesus is being preached, they're casting out demons in Jesus' name, then more power to them. Go for it. Don't worry about it. If they, if they have a bad reason for doing it, or their heart is not in the right place, God is going to deal with them. But you, you don't have to worry about it. And so, it came to pass, verse 51, back in Luke 9, when the time had come, those are important words, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So we're having a, a shift in the book of Luke. This is a new section. Now Jesus, he's been doing ministry now for about three years. He's about 33 years old. He's been touring around, sharing the gospel, preaching the kingdom. And now in this last portion of his life, he's finally set his face to go to Jerusalem. What was going to happen in Jerusalem? He's going to be crucified and he's going to rise again from the dead. He's going to take care of the problem of sin at the cross. And then he's going to prove that he is who he says he is by rising from the dead. But now's the time. Throughout his ministry, as you read throughout the Gospels, he says over and over again, my time has not yet come. 
My time is not yet come. Well, now is the time that he is setting his face to go to Jerusalem for this, for the crucifixion. And verse 52, it says, He sent messengers before his face, and as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. So now the, the Samaritans, we don't have time to get into who they are, but we can say generally speaking, Samaritans were half Jew and half Gentile. And it goes all the way back to the time, um, not Babylon. Who was the other group that came in there that wasn't Babylon? I can't think of the, the name. Oh, well. The, the first invasion that took the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, those guys, when they came in, what they would do is they would take people from different countries and they would mix them with some of the natives of the land and they would leave them there. And then they would take the rest of them captive, Assyria, the Assyrians. They would take them back to Assyria and then they would have them be like their their slaves or whatever over there. So that's what happened in the northern part of Israel when the nation was split into two. When the Assyrians came, they took people, but then they also intermingled other people groups with the Jews that were there in the northern kingdom. And that's how you got the Samaritans. So they're this mixed breed of Jew and Gentile. And they, because they were people from different areas, they had a big melting pot of religion. They, they had like, they believed in idols and they believed in Jesus of, or the Jewish way of doing things. And they just sort of mixed everything together. And it was a big mess. If you read John chapter four, you can get an insight into the, the Samaritans as Jesus meets with the Samaritan woman at the well. So they're going through this area. These, he's, the messengers go before him. And as they went, they entered the Samaritan village to do what? To prepare for Jesus, just as they had been doing earlier, going throughout the region, preparing uh, for Jesus to come through. It says, but they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. So the Samaritans, because of what's going on, because Jesus is on a mission to get to Jerusalem, the Samaritans are rejecting they, they don't want to receive Jesus. Oh, we're not interested in that. Just keep on going. Right? And so well, the disciples' response, verse 54, when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Do you want us to call down fire and just take them out? But he turned, Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So James and John, they're ready to call down fire from heaven and destroy these people because they don't want to hear the message that Jesus has to say. But look at Jesus' response. I didn't come to destroy men's lives. I came to save them. And we should remember that too. Because I think oftentimes in our Christian zealousness, when people reject the message of the gospel, we're very quick to want to call down fire from heaven on them. Well, fine, you don't want that message? Go to hell then. Right? Or perhaps it's, it's the Christians in our, in our world right now who I see on social media bad-mouthing politicians who don't see the same way as they do. Put that scenario in this Bible text. Well, those politicians, Jesus, they're not, they're not following you. They're not doing what your word says. Should we just call down fire from heaven on them? What's Jesus' response? Because we oftentimes wonder, why does God allow these things to happen? Why do these people get to stay in power when they're, when they're against Him? They're allowing all these things to happen that God's Word is clearly against. And yet, it seems sometimes like God is deaf to our ears. And so we take it into our own hands. Or we go to social media and we start talking bad about people. In, in a figurative sense, we're calling down fire from heaven on them. Remember, Jesus said, if you hate somebody 
in your heart. That's the same thing as murdering them. We're calling down fire from heaven on these people when God's word tells us that we should be praying for them. We should be reaching out with the love of Jesus. We should be sharing the gospel, giving them every opportunity to be saved. Because look what it says. Why, why does God allow it? Because he's gracious. He's gracious with me and he's gracious with you. Think about for, for some of us 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. If Jesus called down fire from heaven at that time, would you have even been saved? Or because of his grace and patience with you during that time frame, did that allow for you to be saved? It says in the Old Testament, uh, I believe it's in Ezekiel, that God does not delight in the death of the wicked. And these guys want to call down fire from heaven. We want to call down fire on everybody who doesn't agree with our Christian way. Well, that's not Jesus' way. He didn't come to destroy men's lives. He came to save men's lives. That's what he said. There will be a judgment that's yet future. They will have to pay the consequence for their sin should they choose to not repent and follow Jesus. There will be a penalty. The penalty will be eternity in hell. They will have to stand before Jesus and answer for the things that they did. And the things that are going on and the things that are against God's word. But that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to pray and to share the gospel and let God do the work from there. But Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy men's lives. I came to save them. And then what happened? They went to another village. right? And I, I think sometimes, too, we have this view if I'm not just doing, sometimes it comes from a bad religious upbringing where you've been taught incorrectly about the, the gospel, incorrectly about grace. And you have this idea that if I just step out of line, God's going to strike down me down with fire. What's your view of God? Is he some cosmic tyrant or is he, or is he your loving father? Because I think this verse, Jesus was literally making known the Father on earth. He was everything that God is in human form. And what did he say? I didn't come to destroy men. I came to save them. If he came to save you, why would he wipe you out every time you make a mistake? That's not grace. And the more that we learn that he's gracious, the more that we want to get our act cleaned up so that we're not disappointing our Heavenly Father. And so it says, as we continue to finish this chapter out, finally, now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Maybe you've made a promise like that. Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to them or to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his fed, his fed, his head. I'm, a, I'm an itinerant preacher. I'm going around. I don't even have a house to call my own. I don't have a bed to call my own. He wasn't that Jesus was not taken care of and his disciples weren't taken care of because they were. God provided for them all the time. We just read the story of the feeding of the 5,000 where there was 12 baskets of leftovers for those who followed Jesus, one for each disciple, or apostle, I should say. But as they journeyed on the road, this person says, and it's not that Jesus doesn't want this person to follow him. He just wants him to know what the cost is. Count the cost if you're going to follow him. I'm going to lay down my life and follow you, Jesus. Well, here's the cost. Foxes, they've got holes. They go live in their dens. Birds, they've got nests to go live in. I don't have a place to put my head down at night. You, you sure you want to follow? You want to commit to following me? And then he said to another. Now that was someone saying to him. Now Jesus is saying to someone else, "Hey, follow me. The invitation's open." But he, that person, said, "Lord, let me first go and bury my father." And Jesus said to him, "Let the dead." 
bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. What the heck? Does Jesus not want us to like go to our funerals or like this seems kind of harsh. But this is like, a, and I don't know if it's the right term, like an idiotism or idiotism in the Jewish culture. This would be like, let me first go bury my father. Didn't mean that his dad was on the deathbed. It meant that he, he wanted to wait to follow Jesus until his dad died. I'm, I'll follow you, but, but first, let, let me wait till my dad passes away. I can take care of all the family stuff, and then I'll come and follow you. And Jesus says, no. People are going to die. They keep dying. They're always going to be dying. You let that take care of itself. Let, let the unbelievers, let the dead bury the dead. But you, you come and follow me. If you want to follow me, you follow me right now. Don't wait till later. That's what the next next one is. And another said, Lord, I'll follow you. But first, let me go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow, looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So again, it's not that Jesus doesn't want you to have a going away party. Okay? The idea here is, is that this guy wants to go back to the old life. Give me, let me give it one more round, and then I'll come and follow you. Right? And we see that happen as people uh, are being drawn to the Lord, as they're being uh, called to Him, as, and, and there's this, this desire to read the Word and the, to get saved and to follow Jesus, and they feel that tug at their heart, but then they look back. They look back in, with longing, and they, they think, well, one more night at the club, one more party with my friends, one more movie, one more whatever it is, just one more time, and then I'll commit my life to Jesus. Well, what happens so often is that one more time, they never come back. That one more time leads to a lifetime of continuing in that direction instead of following Jesus. If he's tugging at your heart to follow him, do it right now. Don't go one more round. Turn around and follow him right now. As he says, no one having his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Well, what does that mean? Well, we don't have this agrarian culture like we've been talking about throughout this chapter. But the plowman would hook up his, his plow to the ox and then they would ride on it. But in order to make straight roads in their field, they had to find a fixed point off in the distance. And they had to eyeball that fixed point and just keep going so that their plow would go in a straight line. If they looked over here and looked over there, then their, their lines started going like this, and their farming got all messed up. So the plowman had to be really focused on what he was doing and stay in that straight line, and the same is true of us. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't look over here and look over there. Stay in your lane. Keep your eyes on Jesus and go after Him, period. And, you know, following Jesus is a one-way journey. You decide to follow him, you're gonna, you need to keep going that way. There is no turning back. There's no getting off and moving to the sides. There's no, like, l looking over here and getting distracted. And You want to follow Jesus? You want to do it a biblical way? You want to follow him as a disciple? Keep your eyes on him. Set your, your eyes straight ahead and follow Jesus. There's an old song, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. And just do that. Follow him. Don't turn back. And then see what he does in your life. He says if you do that, you lose your life for my sake, that's where you're going to find life. And so that's my encouragement. Follow Jesus. Look to him. Be gracious with other people as you want Jesus to be gracious with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight just for your word and for the things that you have to show us and to teach us. And we pray that these things would just sink into our hearts and our lives and that we would live them out and that it would be a reality for us. And so would you just bless my brothers and sisters the rest of the week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.